So today we'll be talking about uh, pericardial diseases. Pericardium is a, a double layered sac uh, which surrounds the heart. So it is uh, made up of the two layers, parietal layers and the visceral, uh, visceral and the parietal layers. There is a space between this parietal and the visceral layer, which is filled by the uh, small amount of the fluid, which is known as pericardial fluid. Uh, so normally there is about 50 to uh, 50 ml of the fluid in the pericardial sac, uh, which is the, con uh, the constituent of that fluid is similar to that of the lymph. So the, basically the fluid which is present in the pericardial space and the pericardium itself, uh, they lubricate the surface of the heart, they limit the distension of the heart and they also contribute in the hemodynamic interdependence uh, of the ventricles as well as they act as a barrier of the infection. So they uh, decrease the chances of um, spread of the infection among the local structures. So it has got a very important uh, function for the normal physiological and the physiological activity of the heart. So there are, uh, however, however, there are many diseases which can affect this uh, pericardial uh, space or the pericardium of the heart. So we'll be today talking about the various diseases which can affect the pericardium. One of the most common diseases is acute pericarditis. So this acute pericarditis is the acute inflammatory process which uh, affects the pericardium of the heart. So it may it uh, can occur as an isolated disease or it can coexist with the myocarditis. If there is the presence of coexisting myocarditis, patient can also have the features of myocarditis. Otherwise, patient will present with the features suggestive of the uh, pericardial inflammation. There are various causes of the uh, acute pericarditis. However, uh, uh, viral infections, bacterial infections, and the tubercular infections are the common infections which can cause acute pericarditis. Uh, in the country like ours, we should always consider tuberculosis as a cause of uh, pericarditis while evaluating the patient with the uh, symptoms suggestive of the pericarditis. There are other non-infectious non causes like inflammatory causes, including uh, rheumatoid arthritis, SLE, rheumatic fever, they can also cause the inflammation of the pericardium. Similarly, uh, some kind of the malignancies like CA breast, CA lung, or lymphoma, they can cause the uh, pericarditis. Similarly, the in CKD patients with uremia, there can be the presence of pericarditis. Similarly, any traumatic causes can cause the pericarditis. There is a special group of the uh, pericarditis caused after the uh, myocardial infarction, which is usually known as the Dressler syndrome. Uh, you should know these causes of these um, uh, pericarditis. So now talking about the pathogenesis, uh, usually cause can be identified. However, in some cases, cause is uh, unclear. However, all forms of the pericarditis, either we know the cause or do not know the cause, they usually produce pericardial effusion, which is uh, increase in the fluid, which is present in the pericardial space. So the effusion, it can be either fibrinous, serous, hemorrhagic, or purulent. And the subsequent complications which a patient can develop after pericarditis may depend upon the type of the fluid present in the effusion. Like if it is fibrinous uh, exudate, it may lead to the adhesion formations and later it can lead to the constructive pericarditis. Similarly, serous pericarditis can produce large amount of the effusion leading to the cardiac tamponade. Similarly, uh, if there is a hemorrhagic effusion, it is more suggestive of the malignant diseases like CA breast, CA bronchus or the lymphoma. Similarly, if the patient uh, has got uh, purulent pericarditis, uh, it might be the complication of the sepsis or it can be the from the direct spread from an intrathoracic infection or due to penetrating injury. So the presence of the uh, type of the fluid can help us to differentiate the type, various types of the pericarditis. Uh, and the patients with the pericarditis, they usually typically present with the chest pain. The chest pain is typically retroesternal, which relates to the soldier, neck, and, uh, and to the trapezius rays. This trapezius rays is uh, frequently acts as the MCQs. And the pain typically is aggravated by deep breathing and the movement of the body and the change in the position. Usually, pain is intensified when the patient lies in the supine position and it is relieved when the patient sits up and leans forward. And similarly, the pain is aggravated during exercise and swallowing. So the pain is almost uh, in the similar quality to that of the pleuritic pain of the respiratory system. Uh, so in addition to the pain, uh, many patients will present with the low grade of the fever. And on auscultation, there can be the pericardial friction rub. It is a typical finding in the uh, pericarditis. It, it, if it is present in a patient, then it is almost a diagnostic of the pericarditis. So this sound is a high pitched superficially scratching or crunching noise. Uh, which is produced by the movement of the inflamed pericardium. 
So it is basically heard in systole, but um, it can extend up to the diastole. It has got three components and it is usually of uh, to and fro quality. So if you hear this sound on auscultation, you can uh, make the diagnosis of the pericarditis. So for the diagnosis of the pericarditis, in addition to the, uh, those clinical features, um, investigations will help us to narrow down the diagnosis. So one of the important investigations is ECG. In ECG, there will be the uh, uh, ST elevations with the upward concavity over the affected area. And however, it can be the, there can be diffuse ST elevation, including uh, limb leads as well as the chest leads. So the ST elevation of the uh, pericarditis is different from the uh, ST elevation of the myocardial infarction. In case of the myocardial infarction, there is uh, con concave, uh, it is uh, convex upwards. However, in case of the pericarditis, it is concave upwards. So I'll show you the picture in the next slide. So you need to know this thing, upward concavity and the upward convexity. So that will help us to differentiate between the ST elevations of the MI and the pericarditis because both the condition can present with the acute chest pain and we may need to differentiate these two conditions because the management is totally different. Similarly, uh, in those leads where there is ST elevation, there can also be the deep, uh, presence of the PR interval depression, which is very specific indicator of the acute pericarditis. So this can also come as an uh, MCQ. A diffuse ST segment elevation associated with the PR dip, uh, interval depression. So if this finding is present, it is most likely due to acute pericarditis. However, in the later stage of the inflammation, T wave inversion will be present and this T wave inversion can persist for a few weeks or a few months. And these are present, especially if uh, there is associated myocarditis. So you can see in this picture, there is a, a ST segment elevation uh, in all these uh, limb leads as well as in the chest leads. As you can see in this uh, lead, uh, there is a upward um, concave type of the ST elevation. Similarly, if you see uh, V5 or V6, you can in usually uh, basically in this V6, you can see the uh, concave type of ST elevation. This is unlike that of the myocardial infarction in which there will be the convex up type of the ST elevation. So this will help us to differentiate between the MI and the per uh, acute pericarditis. Similarly, as I have mentioned, there can be the presence of the uh, PR segment uh, depression. There, there can be the PR segment depression like you can see in this lead and this lead also there will be the uh, depression of the PR segment that is due to the concomitant atrial uh, injury current and so this is a typical feature you can see the diffuse ST segment elevation in almost all this in this um, lead one lead two as well as in case of the you can see in the almost uh, every uh, chest lead there is ST segment elevation these are the features typically suggestive of acute pericarditis so next investigation is echocardiography. Echo can be normal sometimes. However, in some cases, you can find the coexisting pericardial effusion because almost every case of the uh, pericarditis, acute pericarditis will have some amount of the pericardial effusion. Similarly, if, you are, if there is any confusion regarding the diagnosis, then we can move uh, to the CT and MRI as an investigation because uh, these investigations will help us to identify the pericardial fluid as well as they will identify the presence of localated effusions we can also see the pericardial thickening and the presence of any kind of the pericardial mass uh, can be detected using CT and MRI. And the MRI typically is useful in the acute pericarditis because it can also detect the presence of the pericardial inflammation. So we might need to perform MRI in some patients. So how to manage the case of acute pericarditis? Uh, basically, patients usually present with the chest pain and the cause is underlying inflammation. So we have to treat the pain and the inflammation. For that, we usually use the aspirin, which is usually used in the anti-inflammatory dose that is almost 600 milligrams, six times a day can be used. Similarly, other NSAIDs can be used like indomethacin, ibuprofen. And these NSAIDs should be continued for one to two weeks, and then they should be tapered uh, slowly over the several weeks. Uh, in addition to NSAIDs, we should also use colchicin, uh, which should be given either as a single do OD dose or BD dose for the three months. The benefit of the colchicine is that it enhances the response to NSAIDs uh, to suppress the inflammation and it also reduces the risk of the recurrent pericarditis. If any patient is not responding to NSAIDs or colchicine, then we can uh, start the patient on the glucocorticoids. However, these glucocorticoids should be used cautiously and they should be uh, tapered rapidly because uh, if uh, we do not uh, taper the glucocorticoid in, properly or uh, very slowly, then there is the chance of the subsequent recurrence of the acute pericarditis. So glucocorticoids should be used 
for the shortest duration possible. Similarly, if uh, if we can identify the uh, cause for the pericarditis, like if it is viral pericarditis, recovery usually occurs within a few days or weeks, and but there can be the recurrence. So uh, only supportive treatment might be need, needed. However, if there is a prurient pericarditis and if any organism is identified, then patient might require the antimicrobial therapy. And in some cases, this prurient pericarditis can lead to the adhesion formations in the fibrinous or the constructive pericarditis. So in those patients, there can be the requirement of the pericardial synthesis or the surgical drainage. So the treatment of the pericarditis basically is to treat the inflammation, to treat the pain and to identify the cause and if possible, treat the cause. So that is how we manage the case of the uh, acute pericarditis. So after understanding about this uh, acute pericarditis, uh, we need to know uh, something about pericardial effusion. So so pericardial effusion means the collection of the uh, large amount of the fluid in the pericardial space. Normally, there is 50 ml of 50 to 60 ml of the fluid in the pericardial space. However, if there is ongoing inflammation in the pericardium, then uh, there will be the increased secretion of the fluid in the collection of the fluid in the pericardial space, which we call it the pericardial effusion. And it is a uh, it usually accompanies the pericarditis and the most of the causes are similar to that of acute pericarditis like viral infection, bacterial infection, tuberculosis, inflammatory causes and other non-inflammatory causes like malignancy, uremia, trauma, push myocardial infarction. All these things can lead to the pericardial effusion. So the clinical features um, differ from that of the acute pericarditis. Patient, uh, uh, in this case, when there is a fluid in between uh, your stethoscope and the heart, there will be a layer of the fluid. So the, when you auscultate the sound, heart, there will be heart sounds will be quieter. And the, if the friction rub was initially present during the phase of acute pericarditis, if there is a development of the effusion subsequently, then the friction rub will diminish in the intensity or they will disappear. And similarly, a patient will feel the retroesternal operation because of the large effusions. And in, if the effusion is very large or if it is developing very rapidly, like in the malignancies, patient can present with the cardiac tamponade. This cardiac tamponade is the acute heart failure which uh, occurs due to the compression of the heart by the fluid which is located in the pericardial space. Uh, this occurs if, especially if the fluid collects rapidly in the pericardium. So uh, this condition is usually characterized by the back stride. Uh, this is also an MCQ. Um, it is frequently asked uh, MCQ. You should know this back stride uh, which consists of the hypotension soft or absent heart sounds and the JVP distension with uh, prominent X descent, but absent Y descent. So hypotension basically it occurs because um, there is a decrease in the cardiac output. So there will be the hypotension. Uh, similarly, when the fluid is constricting the heart from outside, so there will be the decreased venous return to the uh, right heart, right side of the heart. So there will be the distension of the JVP. Uh, similarly, if is there is the fluid in between the your stethoscope and the heart, there will be the softer absent heart sound. So you should know this back stride. If any patient presents with this stride, you should always keep in mind that patient has uh, effusion or the cardiac tamponade, basically uh, for the cardiac tamponade. Uh, patient can also have other features like pulses paradoxes and the decreased um, urine output in the um, state of the cardiac output. We will discuss about this cardiac uh, tamponade in the later, uh, later part of our presentation also. So for the diagnosis of the pericardial effusion, echocardiography is the definitive in investigation because it will help us to quantify the fluid. It will help us to identify whether the fluid is loculated or not, as well as it will help us to monitor the size of the effusion and its effect on the cardiac function. Similarly, it will also help us to identify the site of pericardial synthesis if we are planning to remove the fluid. So echocardiography is a very important investigation for the diagnosis of pericardial effusion. Uh, you can see in this, uh, Picture. This is an echocardial uh, graphy showing the uh, pericardial effusion. This is a this is left ventricle. This is the left ventricular cavity, and you can see this, um, which is shown by the arrow. This is the pericardial space. Uh, usually, this space is very narrow, and there is minimal fluid. However, you can see this space has increased, and there is large amount of the fluid in this space. So, this is the how we diagnose pericardial effusion in the echocardiography. So, next investigation is ECG. Uh, if there is a fluid in between the electrode ECG leads in the heart, then the QRS voltage will be reduced. So the patient with the pericardial effusion will have low voltage ECG and there can be the electrical alternance. Electrical alternance, uh, uh, it occurs due to the swinging of the heart in the pericardial uh, fluid sac because when there is large amount of fluid in the pericardial sac, 
then the um, during systole the, and the diastole the heart will keep on swinging inside that pericardial fluid so there will be the fluctuation in the axis of the qrs complex as well as p wave and the q wave uh, sorry t wave so if this this feature suggestive of uh, electric alternances if there is present then uh, we should uh, suspect that there is the presence of the pericardial effusion in that patient as you can see in this uh, ecg uh, the axis of the qrs complex it uh, it is changing with the um, bit to bit there is variation in the axis of the QRS complex. So uh, this is suggestive of the electric alternance. So the next investigation is X-ray, chest X-ray. So in the chest X-ray, when there is collection of the large amount of the fluid in the pericardium, the cardiac seal out will be increased and the heart will appear like a globular shape of the globular shape or it will look like the water uh, flask type of the uh, appearance will be present. Uh, similarly, next investigation is the aspiration of the effusion fluid uh, if you want to identify the causative organism or any other investigations are needed to be done then we can aspirate the effusion like if you are suspecting tuberculosis then we can aspirate the fluid and test it for the acid fast bacilli similarly we can do the uh, pcr tests to identify various uh, viral etiology as well as we can see the malignant presence of the malignant cells so aspiration of the effusion can also be the important investigation when we are trying to find out the cause of effusion so this is the X-ray showing the global heart. You can see uh, this cardiac load has increased and uh, the heart looks like the flask. So this is also an X-ray globular flask bed or water bottle heart uh, is typically seen in pericardial effusion. So for the management of the pericardial effusion, the management depends upon the extent of the effusion. If the effusion is uh, very large or if the patient is in the state of uh, cardiac tamponade, which is a card, uh, medical emergency, we have to uh, manage it immediately if the patient has got hemodynamic compromise. And the management in those cases include the uh, aspiration of the effusion. Uh, for the aspiration, we insert the needle under the eco guidance uh, and remove the fluid. And if in some cases, if the you suspect that the pericardial effusion is going to increase rapidly even after drainage or the aspiration, then we have to keep the pericardial drain in situ and drain the pericardial fluid regularly. Uh, so that the patient gets uh, symptomatically better and his hemodynamical compromise will resolve. So however, if there is a presence of the viscous fluid, uh, if there is loculated effusion or if there is a recurrent effusion present, then in some cases there, can, there might be the need of the surgical drainage of the pericardial fluid. So next important topic is the pericard, uh, tuberculous pericarditis. It is very common in the our part of the world. However, it is a uh, in the decreasing trend in the western part uh, western world so we should know about uh, this topic also so it usually coexists with the pulmonary tb it means that it is usually the manifestation of the pulmonary tb and the patient usually present with the symptoms similar to that of the uh, pulmonary tb like they will present with chronic malaise weight loss low grade fever and they can also present with the features of the pericardial constriction or the tamponade like uh, tamponade which we also mentioned earlier and in some cases there can be the associated of the associated pleural effusion and patient will have other respiratory symptoms suggestive of the pulmonary tb so we should always suspect um, uh, tuberculosis patient uh, who present with the features of the pericarditis to have the pericardial effusion so for the diagnosis of the tuberculosis pericard uh, pericarditis we need to aspirate the fluid and examine the fluid for the presence of the tubercle bacilli. We can also send the culture for the tubercle bacilli and we can also perform the uh, molecular test like gene expert test which uh, tests for the PC, uh, DNA or the uh, DNA of the organism. So we can uh, use the gene expert test like gene expert to identify the tubercle bacilli, presence of the tubercle bacilli in the fluid for the diagnosis. So once we make the diagnosis, the treatment is basically the use of the anti-tuberculous chemotherapy as per the guidelines. And also in addition to the anti-tubercular therapy, we have to use the uh, steroids for the three month duration. Um, the initial dose is usually 60 mg per uh, day prednisolone, uh, which is gradually tapered over the three month duration. So the next important uh, inflammatory condition affecting the pericardium is chronic constrictive pericarditis. It is usually the complication of the acute pericarditis and the cause are also almost similar to the causes of acute pericarditis. 
So in this condition, there is usually the, when the pericardium is inflamed due to any kind of the etiology, there will be the progressive thickening and fibrosis and basically the calcification of the pericardial. So when the calcium, when the pericardium is thick, fibrous or calcified, then the heart will not be able to um, relax or relax properly. So that it cannot feel properly. So in addition, if there is coexisting myocardial calcification, uh, then there will be the impaired contraction of the uh, heart so it will cause the heart failure basically it will cause the diastolic heart failure because heart cannot relax properly or contract properly and it cannot feel properly so you have to um, treat the patient accordingly so the causes basically uh, include the uh, other causes of uh, uh, acute pericarditis like viral infections in non-inflammatory causes or the inflammatory causes like rheumatic arthritis and in our part of the world Tuberculous pericarditis is also a very important cause of chronic constrictive pericarditis. However, in many cases, it is almost uh, very difficult to identify the uh, original insult or the original cause for the chronic constrictive pericarditis. So basically, clinical features include the, uh, they will present with the feature of the systemic venous congestion. That is, they will almost present with the sign of the uh, right-sided heart failure. Like they will present with the ascites and uh, they can also present with the hepatomegaly or in some cases they can present with atrial fibrillation uh, in which there will be irregular pulses pulse as well as pulse deficit and in some cases patient will present with breathlessness but the breathlessness is usually not pro uh, prominent feature of this condition because uh, lungs are seldomly uh, congested in this condition however the diagnosis is usually missed because the uh, this presentation is almost similar to the other causes of the right heart failure so if we see any patient with the right heart failure and who has a small heart or echo or x-ray, then we should always suspect that the patient has the constrictive pericarditis because if we miss the diagnosis, uh, the outcomes will be grave for that patient. Again, this is the picture taken from the Davidson's uh, 23rd edition. You can see the clinical features of the constrictive pericarditis in this uh, picture, like patient will present with fatigue, there will be the uh, rapid low volume pulse, as well as there will be um, the elevated JVP, and there can be the uh, or loud or early third heart sound, which is also known as pericardial knock. And there can be the paradoxical increase in the JVP during ins inspiration, which is known as cosmos sign. Uh, the other features of the right heart failure, like hepatomegaly, ascites, and peripheral edema, and also patient can present with pulses paradoxes in some cases. So for the investigation of the chronic uh, constrictive pericarditis, chest X-ray has an important role because it uh, will help us to identify the uh, calcification which is present in the pericardium. So this is also MCQ. They will ask you what will you see on the chest x-ray in a patient with chronic constrictive pericarditis. The answer will be presence of the pericardial calcification. So you should know this. You can see this is a lateral chest x-ray of a patient with chronic constrictive pericarditis. And you can see these calcifications uh, all over here. These are suggestive of the chronic constrictive pericarditis. So the next uh, investigation is echocardiography. You can uh, do the echocardiography uh, to identify the disease. And similarly, you can uh, do the CT scan. In CT scan, you will again see the uh, pericardial calcifications. And also, if, you, uh, if there is some uh, confusion regarding the diagnosis, you can uh, do the other complex studies like uh, eco-doppler studies and the cardiac catheterization. And these are basically done if you, are, if you want to distinguish between the um, the restrictive cardiomyopathy and the chronic constrictive pericarditis because these two conditions uh, they will present with a similar type of manifestation and in some cases you might need to differentiate them because the treatment modality is different for both of the cases. So the management of the chronic constrictive pericarditis typically uh, is the management of the diastolic heart failure. So you will be using the diuretic loop diuretics for the management of the heart failure. Similarly, uh, we can use the aldosterone antagonists like spironolactone. And if uh, some patients uh, who are um, refractory to the medical treatment or um, if there is a severe disease, then some patient might uh, require the surgical resection of the diseased pericardium. So that will, imp uh, that will have the dramatic improvement in the symptoms, but uh, the surgery has got high chances of high morbidity to the patients. Similarly, there is a uh, next topic is the cardiac tamponade. You should also know about this because it is a medical emergency and you may encounter these patients with cardiac tamponade in the emergency in your clinical practice. So you should know about this condition, about how to diagnose it and how to treat it. So the cardiac tamponade, uh, tamponade it is a acute heart failure due to the compression of the heart. 
which results from the large amount of the pericardial uh, effusion. So the large amount of the pericardial fluid, which is present in the pericardium, will compress the heart from the outside. So due to that reason, the heart won't be able to fill properly. And so there will be the hemodynamic compromise and patient may present uh, to your OPD or the emergency um, in the grave condition. So it is usually the complication uh, of the pericarditis and it can uh, occur due to any cause of the pericarditis. So it can also occur due to malignant diseases like as I have mentioned, uh, CA bronchus or lymphoma. As well, it can occur following the trauma to trauma, like the, it can occur after blunt trauma or the penetrating trauma. Similarly, uh, it can occur following the myocardial infarction when there is a rupture of the free wall of the myocardium. So the patient usually present with the hypotension. They will have a, a very low BP or BP may not be record, recordable and they will have tachycardia and the JBP will be markedly raised as well as patient will be dyspneic and in some cases patient may present in a collapsed state. Similarly, uh, the heart sound will be uh, very soft and there can be the early third heart sound can be present. Similarly, uh, presence of the pulses paradoxes uh, can be there. If, the, if, he, uh, if there is a presence of the pulses paradoxes, it will help us to diagnose the tamponade, uh, tamponade because it is one of the important signs in this condition. This pulses paradoxes means the a uh, fall in last fall in the blood pressure during inspiration when the pulse may not be palpable. Normally, there is a uh, less than 10 millimeters of the mercury fall of the blood pressure during inspiration. However, if there is more than 10 millimeters of the mercury uh, drop in the blood pressure during inspiration, then that is known as pulses paradoxes. It is one of the very important signs of the cardiac component. So you should know this because this is also asked as MCQs. So for the diagnosis of the uh, tamponade, echocardiography is the confirmatory test. It will help us to identify the uh, tamponade as well as it will help us to identify the optimal site for the aspiration of the fluid. And um, other in supportive investigations include ECG. In the ECG, you can find the uh, underlying diseases like uh, presence of the MI or the features of pericarditis. And similarly, there can be the electrical alternance as we have discussed earlier and there can also be the low voltage ECG complexes. Similarly, in the chest X-ray, there can be the enlarged globular heart. However, the heart may be normal if the uh, temperament has developed acutely without any previous insult. So for the management of the tamponade, uh, it is a medical emergency and the percutaneous pericardiosynthesis is the treatment. It results in the dramatic improvement. However, in some cases, uh, if this uh, condition uh, cannot be treated by percutaneous uh, pericardial synthesis, then surgical drainage might be needed. And similarly, after you stabilize the patient, you have to identify the underlying cause and you have to treat the cause. So, but uh, most important thing is that you should identify the patients with cardiac tamponade because if you miss the diagnosis, patient can uh, die when they present to the ER. So you should um, uh, know the backstride and you should uh, identify or diagnose the patient properly. So once you diagnose the patient, you can uh, manage it, manage them accordingly. So these are the references. So thank you very much for today.